Okay, so now we uh, bring back to the podium uh, Dr. Rob Cowell. Um, just a reminder, he is with the uh, Baylor Heart and Vascular Hospital in Dallas and is also a member of the Heart Rhythm Society Board of Trustees. Um, he will be talking about uh, some of the you know, some of the newer procedures. He does a lot of innovative stuff, and I asked him to talk about that as well as the left atrial appendage procedures that electrophysiologists do. So um, let me bring up Dr. Cowell. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, I'm going to shift a little bit in this talk um, and bring up uh, kind of what's coming down the pike in, in newer technologies to treat AFib from a variety of standpoints. And I'll start by saying um, none of what I'm going to show you is completely FDA approved. So when we've been working with these things, they've been on studies. Um, they're coming soon to a theater near you, but not all of them are ready. Although I'll point out one or two things we're, we're doing in trials now that we, you can get involved with. Um, so kind of to review where we've been, in this discussion, the um, yeah, there's a pointer. I'll point over here. The the vein. This is the left atrium from the looking from the back, and these are the pulmonary veins, as Dr. Rizvi pointed out. And in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, these stars represent these triggering sites in the vein, and those trigger atrial fibrillation. And it's trying to wall off those triggers that we're trying to do. When you start moving to people who have atrial fibrillation for a longer duration or in it all the time, persistent atrial fibrillation, suddenly we're trying to deal with a different uh, beast here. It evolves. And a lot of time what's going on is there are triggers in the atrium itself that are driving the atrial fibrillation. Uh, some of these are, are, are focal sites. Some of these are termed rotors. We don't need to get into why that is. It's kind of engineering 303. But, but Needless to say, that's our terminology for them. And, and part of the issue of developing new technology revolves around trying to better treat this transition. So, um, so let's go back again, the, summarizing the last two slides, the two current approaches that are both done a lot and FDA approved involve using radio frequency to make this kind of point by point encircling of the veins. And this is a view of the left atrium from inside, a 3D recreation creation, or using the balloon kind of in one fell swoop to kind of make that lesion around the veins. Um, and um, there, are, there are issues and limitations with each. So one of the reasons why atrial fibrillation recurs is that um, we haven't recognized, um, or when, we've, when we've tried to isolate these pulmonary veins, we do an incomplete job. And little gaps can occur in where these uh, points are, and AFib can recur. So point by point, the limitation is gaps are very common. And when you bring people back for a new procedure, it's not uncommon that every vein has a gap. With cryo, that is still seen, but less so. The other issue that makes these procedures hard is, is the gaps form because you can't see where you are. You literally can't visualize in the atrium what's going on. The mapping systems help, but they're still crude, and it's not like looking at it. And you'll hear from the surgeon in a little bit, one of the great advantages of surgery is you can actually see what you're doing and see the tissue. So that's a problem in both of these modalities. And what about other targets? So a second reason why the procedure fails is, as I, as I mentioned in the first slide, there are sites that can trigger atrial fibrillation in a subset of people that are not coming from the veins, that are coming from elsewhere. And the balloon can't go after those as, when, when used in the way it's designed. Radiofrequency catheters can, but it's very hard to identify those. So a lot of the new tools are designed to combat these limitations. So the first one um, is something called the laser balloon. And this is, not, this is designed for treating people uh, with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And this is a schematic of the balloon in the left atrium seated at the uh, opening of the vein, ready to treat it. And the way it works is that it, it's a clear balloon that from this point here as a fiber optic cable that can emit a laser uh, to, to 
cook the tissue locally and scar it. And if you look from the shaft, this is the laser. And essentially, you move that laser around the opening of the vein so that you can actually um, recreate what you do with radiofrequency, but with laser. And what's neat about this is you can actually see where you are. Now, this is pretty crude, but this is the tissue at the vein opening, and that's the vein opening itself. So you can literally watch through a fiber optic cable and see exactly what you're doing. Um, and this is under trials now, and I think it has some promise, but it still has a couple limitations as well. Um, uh, and I, 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 I will talk about limitations a lot in this, mainly because doctors want to see the evidence that things work, and these are the questions you need to ask when you're confronted by the laser and new things that all sound good. You've got to ask all the right questions. And the limitations are it's still point to point. So even though, you can see it, even though you can see where you're going, there's still a risk of having gaps. Hopefully, those gaps are going to be fewer because of the fact that you can see where you are. And the other problem is you can't target what we call non-PV targets or non-pulmonary vein sites, these sites in the left atrium that could be triggering atrial fibrillation but can't be attacked by going right around the vein. So limitations, but still a promising new technology that we're going to be hearing about. Probably there'll be more trials out very shortly on this. So that's paroxysmal. Let's look at what's being done in persistent or long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. And when you look at what we do now, there's a variety of different approaches. And these are um, map diagrams. You've seen a little of this before of the left atrium with a different type of lesion sets. And what I mean by lesions is where these burns are being placed, and those are all represented by red dots. And what you can see is rather than, in this approach, rather than just kind of circling around the veins, we're really creating this kind of, um, kind of network of, of linear and curved lesions to try to uh, get rid of AFib by compartmentalizing areas. You'll notice this is very reminiscent of what you're going to hear about on the surgical side, what's called the maze procedure. And essentially, this is electrophysiologists trying to recreate what has been defined in the surgery world, but with a catheter, okay? Um, and this is an approach, and it, we call this, I, I personally call this chicken pox in essence. You look at this, there's red dots everywhere. And this is an attempt to actually not just empirically create lines and curves, but to try to target sites that look electrically like triggers of atrial fibrillation. And these are termed cafes. Again, not really important why they're termed that, but that's a term you will hear. And when you hear cafe, it's synonymous with trying to find sites responsible for, for triggering the atrial fibrillation. Um, but there are issues with these two approaches. Um, these linear type lesions are difficult, and again, you still have these gap problems. So anywhere along these um, burn areas, you can have gaps between the burns, and when you do, you can cause new rhythm problems. Um, these cafe sites, um, while it sounds great, are very poor, uh, difficult to define, and we have different definitions of how we look for those, and it's, it's not completely uniform yet. Um, the other general rule of thumb is that the more energy you deliver, either cryo or radiofrequency, the higher your risk of complications. So the balance we face when doing these procedures is kind of knowing when to say when, right? Do, if I keep burning, I may have a higher success rate, but I will definitely have a higher complication rate. So that's the balance we're trying to strike during the procedure. Um, and then when you do these procedures uh, and there are gaps, you have a fairly high in incidence of a, a rhythm called left atrial flutter. And what that is is uh, the, that all these burns transform the fibrillation into a short circuit that is localized but is still a short circuit. And in some cases, in, well, in most cases, that goes away. In some cases, that can be a worse problem from the standpoint of symptoms than the atrial fibrillation ever was. And so, again, we, we have to kind of balance what we do to try to prevent that. So um, one approach to dealing with this is actually changing the tools we use. And under trial, 
is a new set of catheters that tries to attack these different sites. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's a, an approach that recognizes that there's different areas you've got to ablate, and so we need different tools for that. So there's a circular ablating and recording tool for the pulmonary veins. There's this funny-looking thing that is used to treat one area of the atrium and this one to kind of make kind of spot welding almost of, of other areas of the atrium. And this is under trial. Um, and it's, it's a combined tool set idea, which, which is very inviting. Um, and thus far, there's six month trial data showing with persistent atrial fibrillation about a 67% success rate, which is actually very good with that population. Um, what came from the first trial though is an increased risk for, of stroke when using these tools compared to other tools. So they've been redesigned and they're about to go through yet another trial to make sure it's safe to use broadly. And so um, this is a, a study we may be starting up uh, early next year um, called Victory and more to come on that. So this is one approach. Um, again, uh, limitation wise, um, there's not uh, a, an ability to kind of map where to go. You're still kind of using this empirically. Um, so uh, the other approach is to try to actually map where these sites are coming from. And what I'm going to refer to now is something called firm mapping, which a lot of you may have heard about. We've had the pleasure of, of working with a bit. And the idea here is uh, if this is the chamber with atrial fibrillation, right now we record from individual sites. But in firm mapping, you put in catheters that have multiple electrodes in the form of a basket, and you record the whole chamber simultaneously. And then from there, um, you run through signal, complex signal processing algorithms to define where sites are that trigger. As I mentioned, they're called rotors. And then you can localize where those are based on where that basket is, and then you burn those sites. Um, and this is an example of the basket sitting in the right atrium during one of our cases. Um, and I'm going to skip this because it's long and doesn't necessarily help to explain it. But um, what's the data to support this? The, the, the data is still small and there's a lot to learn about this, but it's, it's, it's promising. And the first published study is 92 people who um, had predominantly persistent atrial fibrillation and this was a uh, comparison of patients who had pulmonary vein isolation, a traditional approach, versus pulmonary vein isolation plus this firm mapping to target additional sites. And this is, again, one of these Kaplan-Meier curves, these, these success curves now flipped over. So 100% um, success would be at the top and 0% success would be at the bottom. This is the people who got the standard approach. And this is the people over time who got the firm mapping with the standard approach and overall did better. Um, what are the limitations with this? I think it's very promising. The baskets are very unwieldy to use and um, there are new baskets being developed. So that's why this is not completely, partially FDA approved but not fully. And I think by, by um, uh, first quarter of next year we're going to get a whole new set of tools to work with this. And we're still waiting for a randomized trial to know exactly what the best patient group is for this technology. Um, then the, 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 the last new thing is really a combination of two existing things. And I'm, I'm really excited about this. And that is the concept that AFib doesn't exist in its own, okay? As I had said before, you have high blood pressure, you have sleep apnea, all those things need to be treated or treating your AFib doesn't help. Well, this is a concept where you treat two things at once. And I'm gonna take a step back first. Uh, it's a concept called renal denervation, and I'm gonna do a little introduction. We all have a, something called the autonomic nervous system. And this is the most primitive nervous system in our bodies that control things that we don't think about. Breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, and so all those things are controlled on a second-by-second -second basis by the autonomic system. Well, it turns out the autonomic system also can negatively impact and cause atrial fibrillation. And one of the sites where the autonomic system is regulated is at the blood vessels that go to the kidneys, okay? The kidneys are what cause us to urinate and filter. And so this is a diagram of the kidney blood vessels here 
And it's a combination where the autonomic nervous system regulates those blood vessels and then has sensors that sense flow through those kidneys that regulate it back. And there has been a move in the high blood pressure world that if you do red dots, if you ablate not the heart but these kidney vessels, you can affect high blood pressure in people. And it looks like it's going to be very successful. Well, the question that was asked is, well, what if we combine this with atrial fibrillation? So literally, as you're pulling the catheter out of the body, you do this. And what's been found is that in 27 patients, this is small, um, with atrial fibrillation and high blood pressure, when you did the pulmonary vein isolation with renal denervation, this ablation of the veins, you did far better than doing it, uh, the pulmonary vein isolation alone. Um, and in fact, you also lowered the blood pressure. So is it just a blood pressure effect? Are you actually affecting the AFib? We don't know yet. We are pleased that we're part of a trial now that's enrolling at Baylor Heart and Vascular to actually look at this. And this is a national trial. It's actually a very special national trial because there is no company sponsor. It is physicians who are running this trial. It's, it's a very aggressive um, trial and a new way of doing things. Um, I quickly, can I take two extra minutes? Okay. I quickly want to talk about um, what's coming in the realm of um, devices to prevent stroke. We've all heard about stroke being an important target. We've all heard about the various drugs uh, to, to prevent stroke. The question that is being asked is, can we actually avoid drugs? And so where do strokes come from? This is a an ultrasound image of the heart. This is the left atrium, and this is a structure called the left atrial appendage. And in fact, this is a little outpouching where blood clots are believed to form that then break off and cause the stroke. So um, the question then is, can we prevent the stroke by sealing off that left atrial appendage with some type of device? And um, one device being tested uh, is called the Watchman device, and it, it, it looks like an umbrella or a parachute. And um, again, the details are not that important, but it's made of a pliable metal called nitinol. Um, and this is an example of how it goes in. We put a catheter in that appendage. Uh, we then size it, pick the right device, and then that sits in there. And that doesn't, the story doesn't end there. You still need blood thinners for a little bit of time. Because what happens then is the body kind of heals over this area and fibrosis it closed so that eventually that seals up. And now three or four months after the procedure, you can stop the blood thinner, okay? And that is very effective. I'm going to focus on this graph here. And what this is, a randomized study looking at warfarin, traditional blood thinner, versus this occlusion device and looking at the endpoint of disabling events. And these are events that are strokes or bleeds that truly disabled someone. And what you see, and this is events for every 100 patient year, and what you can see is there are fewer than half the number of events with the device than there are with warfarin, depending on where you look along the course of the trial. And this has been measured out uh, over two years, so it's very promising. Um, there are... Um, the limitations, it takes several weeks for the appendage to close. It's, it's not easy to do these. You're going to need to find people when these come out who are used to doing it. Um, and like I said, it's not yet FDA approved. Um, an alternative approach to this is something called the Lariat procedure. And I'll, I'm just going to go through this quickly. This is a snare from the outside of the heart, okay? And so what we do, this is a little hard to see, we get access under the rib cage to the area outside the heart, and we get access inside the heart, and then we get a little wires that, using a magnet, connect, and then that snare is placed over that wire to lead to occluding the appendage, and I'm going to skip over that. And um, what, what's, what's emerged from that is about of all the patients we look at who could be eligible for this, about 70% can actually get their left atrial appendage occluded with this approach. And if, it, if that does happen, the likelihood of staying closed and occluded is, is very high in the 99, 98% range. Um, 
Limitation-wise, again, these are complicated procedures. They're not easy to do right now. Um, they're not yet FDA approved. And now when you go outside the heart, you introduce some new complications like some chest pain from outside the heart. So um, uh, uh, to close, uh, you know, uh, what the general conclusions just from take-homes from this are that there are, gonna, there are now and will continue to be new tools that will be developed to make AFib ablation easier to do, safer to do, and hopefully more successful. And I think the other approach is that stroke prevention is going to be evolving too. So when I have patients who say to me, am I stuck on Coumadin for the rest of my life? What I say is, it's redefined. We are going to have a stroke prevention strategy for you for the rest of your life, but that may change, and it may change every few years on how we do that. So um, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Cowell.